Albers. That's our word. Brought to you by Bitcut and not theme fun because today I'm going solo. Um, how are you guys doing today? So for those of you who didn't catch the last episode, uh, we are doing a Patreon thing. Uh, check it out at patreon.com slash Jesus. And if you do that, you'll have access to uh, Patreon-only episodes of Albert's. Uh, there's already two up already. We already have our first uh, patron, uh, and I'll pull his name up now, David Johnson Wilson, so thank you. Uh, yeah, if you donate $2 a month, you'll have access to uh, to uh, Patreon-only content, uh, and hopefully there'll be more soon. So today is International Podcast Day, and the plan was to have Matt come on and talk about the Clinton and Trump debate and talk about how about how horrible and great it was at the exact same time. Uh, I even had my notes written for him, but uh, the problem is uh, he couldn't uh, get Discord to work on Linux and FiendPhone doesn't work on Linux and he can't get his microphone to work on Windows. So uh, we tried for an hour to get everything working and just said, fuck it. Uh, we're going to try trying to get Fiend phone compiled for Linux. Um, so if you have any help that you want to offer him getting a uh, fiend phone for Linux, by all means, uh, please do so. So for international podcast day, the podcast libertarians on fire did a show about nine 11 conspiracy theories, where she was going to go through all the different big uh, conspiracy theories revolving around nine 11, and then do a commentary on what he thinks about them afterwards. Now I did not listen to it because I'm, I, I really don't care about nine 11. I, I, I originally came from the bill Cooper uh, school of, of that. And I, that's where I was doing at the time nine 11 happened. So I got to see him talk about it and he was never a fan of the conspiracy theories around. And he thought that he believed quote unquote, the official story and was very much in favor of going into Afghanistan, uh, and rooting on bin Laden and stuff. Uh, despite what people, what, it, what did they say about him now? Uh, the archive.org, uh, archive of his website definitely didn't lie. And I was there. I saw it live. Uh, and, uh, it wasn't until years later that, that the nine 11 stuff came out and then I became a critic. Uh, by then I have already been out of the conspiracy circuit and I was very critical of nine 11 conspiracy theories. I have been debating these things for a while and I've kind of retired. I tried starting it up this year after the 15th anniversary, but you know, people kept breaking the rules and my, my rules were very simple. It's like, just stay on topic. If we're talking about world trade seven, don't bring up, you know, the first building or the second building, because we're, that's what we're talking about later. We can, we can discuss that, but, but for now, one thing at a time, because conspiracy theorists like to jump around. They like to talk about nine. Then once you kind of corner them with something rather than respond to it, they go, well, what about this? What about Larry Silverstein? What about the, it's like, no, 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 let's just stay on this one topic. Come to a consent, like don't come sort of some more agreement that it's true or false. You can convince me or I can convince you, but let's stick on this until we move on. And no one wanted to do that. Uh, the, that, that rule was, if you broke it, that I would just give you a copy pasta that says, Hey, that's not relevant to what we're talking about. Can we go back to this particular subject and work this one out first? And then we'll talk about that. Uh, and then the other one was don't accuse me of believing everything the government says I'm a libertarian, uh, <laughs> that ergo, I don't believe everything the government tells me. Uh, if I did, then I wouldn't be a libertarian. Um, and besides, you know, you believing everything the government tells you, uh, you believe everything the government tells you about the earth being a sphere. So, you know, you know, why, why are you believing everything that they say? Right. Uh, that's, it's not a valid argument. The government can be right every once in a while. They can say things that are true every once in a while. Um, either way. So that he did that episode that kind of gave me inspired, like maybe I should, uh, do a podcast day podcast, but I'll do it solo. Uh, and I wanted to talk about something that has been kind of piquing my interest recently. Uh, and that really has to do with the JFK assassination, which is very more, much more interesting because in, I started listening to the very beginning of it, of course. Uh, then I was like, I'm not really interested in nine 11 stuff, but he said like, you don't believe everything that the Warren commission tells you. Right. And my immediate response was, well, actually, yes, because I've, I've read it. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of have an idea of what it's about. So like years and years and years ago, I had read the, the Warren commission, uh, coming, coming out of the, the conspiracy stuff. And, um, of course I had a very, very fringe view of the JFK assassination. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but, um, uh, basically I want to kind of break this episode into two pieces. I kind of want to go over, uh, Vincent Lugosi's, uh, 52, 53 pieces of evidence, 
uh, against Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, the original plan was that I actually did record some of it, and I'm starting all over again uh, because I was like, this is, this is just way too much information. But I want to kind of go over some, some of the more important pieces of those 52 pieces of evidence that he cites uh, in his book and then also kind of go over some of the main criticisms of the Warren Commission and some of the, the allegations made by conspiracy theories. Now, I know that like 75% or more, definitely more, uh, of you who are listening are probably of the opinion that there was something else going on in the JFK assassination. The Warren Commission was not accurate, and they're intentionally or unintentionally leaving things out because there's some other grand conspiracy that's been going on. There was a shooter on the grassy knoll. There was a, there was a hidden sniper in the, in, in the sewer, or uh, you know, there was aliens, or um, you know, the driver did it, or something. So there, I know that this is probably going to be the least popular episode of the Lulberts and not just from the fact that it's also a deviation from what we normally do at the Lulberts, which is I have a co-host on and we make fun of everything, everything, uh, statism. Uh, we make fun of the, the news that's been going on. We make fun of other libertarians. We make fun of everything. Like there's, there's no taboo. Um, and this is not going to be a very funny episode. This is going to be more of a kind of a fact laden, laden thing where I want to lay out the case that JFK uh, killed J, uh, excuse me, that Oswald killed JFK uh, alone on the sixth floor of the book depository building with the Mount Kirkconnell rifle, um, and then shot JD Tippett shortly afterwards uh, while fleeing uh, the police. So I'm coming at this from a very big disadvantage. I know that most people are listening are going to already disagree with me uh, because they have read books about the JFK assassination from the conspiracy standpoint. They have uh, seen the the film that Oliver Stone made a uh, terrible film, by the way, uh, JFK. They have uh, seen maybe some documentaries on YouTube or, you know, heard, heard Alex Jones screaming about it or something. Everybody has, it's almost impossible to live on this planet and not have engaged in, in, in that material. However, how many of those people who are critical of the Warren Commission have actually read the Warren Commission, uh, Warren Commission's report? Have you read the Warren Commission's report? Okay, well, I have. And uh, I've also, uh, it's almost impossible to read this book unless you're really a huge fan of the JFK assassination stuff. Uh, I have perused it before. I'm thinking about buying it and reading it actually like as a book. Um at least the first 16, 1600 pages or so, because it's a two, two, uh, you know, 2,600 page volume. Uh, 1600 of it is, you know, the, the case against Oswald and the conspiracy theorists. And the other thousand pages is just documentations and footnotes and end notes and all that stuff. It's just all, all the facts. Um, so I'm going to kind of go over a lot of the 52 pieces of evidence. I'm not going to read it to you like I was going to do. And I was like, oh, this is tedious. Uh, but I'm kind of going to explain a lot of the things that were going on. Um, but yes. Uh, so please, if you have not read the Warren's Commission Report yourself, if you have not read it yourself, if you haven't read uh, Vince uh, Buglio, Bu Buliosi, excuse me, G is silent, Buliosi's uh, book, um, you probably might want to say, hey, you know what, maybe we should take a look at the other side and see what the other side is saying before we jump to conclusions that, oh, well, these people say they've read the Warren Commission report and wrote a book about how it's wrong. Therefore, I, I can conclude that it's wrong. That's not how you do things. But either way, so. Like I said, it's going to be divided into two parts. We're going to talk about the fifty-two pieces of inf uh, fifty-three, excuse me, pieces of information uh, Buliosi provides, and uh, and then talk about this. So, yeah. Okay, so those of you who don't know, Vincent Buliosi was a prosecutor uh, for I think L.A. County. LA, LA County. Yeah. LA County. Uh, he, per I knew all about the guy. Um, anyways, he is a, he was a pr uh, prosecutor for the Manson conspiracy, uh, trial, uh, which he ended up convicting, uh, Charles Manson for conspiracy of murder. Now, since then he had retired and kind of, kind of, uh, made his living off writing. Uh, he wrote a very, um, uh, Probably, no, actually, not probably is. It is the best-selling uh, true crime novel ever written called, or true crime 
book called uh, Helter Skelter about the Manson trial, uh, which was then later adapted into a film. Uh, he also wrote a book called Outrage, which he kind of lays out the case against O.J. Simpson and how he was outraged um, that O.J. got off with murder. And uh, he wrote a book about the drug war, which I don't agree with, but he did write it. And then later he wrote a book uh, kind of talking mostly kind of based off something he did in London in the early 80s called uh, Re uh, Reclaiming History, where he tries to rebut the uh, conspiracy theories book. Like I said, this is a huge tome. Uh, one of the positive reviews of the book actually mentioned that this book does not go on your table. It is the table. Um, and the publisher was jokingly said that they were concerned that perhaps um, someone who was reading this may fall asleep uh, with it in their lap and then not wake up because it would crush them to death. Um, but either way, it is a thick book. Uh, it's more, it's, I more kind of seen it as, as a point of like, okay, like here's, here's a claim that conspiracy theorists make. You open up that chapter and then you can use that chapter and say like, okay, this is, this is, you know, this is, here's all the facts and all the evidence. Here's what they say. Here's what the fa the facts say. And here's why they're wrong and whatever. So it's kind of like that sort of book, but you know, if you're really baby buff, you can try to read it yourself. But in the early eighties uh, or so, um, he was contacted to participate in a mock trial, which he was asked to do quite frequently, and he declined. Which he said, no, hold on. They said, wait, wait, hold on. Before you jump, we're going to let you know what this is about and why it's different than what other people, I'm sure, have asked you. Is that they had access to all the information from the Warren Commission, including the witnesses. The All of the witnesses from the Warren Commission were actually going to testify in this court, this mock court in London, they were going to use a real uh, a real attorney to uh, to defend Oswald, uh, a, a, a well respected attorney, by the way. He's actually a cowboy attorney, which is funny because he wears a cowboy hat and stuff. And then he claims to have never lost a, a major uh, any kind of case before. Um, and then they actually got some people from Dallas who were actually in the Dallas jury pool to, and, you know they. They, pick, they did a jury selection and picked these people and then flew them out to London and then had them all sitting there. Now, so they had an actual – like, for all intents and purposes, this was an actual uh, court case against Lee Harvey Oswald. The only difference is that even if Lee Harvey Oswald was alive, he wouldn't have, you know, been busted for it or whatever because it's, it's not having legal standing. It's just, um, it's just a, kind of a show trial. And secondly, Lee Harvey Oswald's dead, so <laughs> there's nothing too much they can do. But because of this, um, because of this trial, and actually after the trial and everything was over, they ended up finding him guilty uh, uh, of murder, uh, the murder of JFK. Um, and uh, he later on started compiling all of the conspiracist claims and started writing a book and it took him many years to complete this book. And it's a really fascinating book, but either way. So let's go over or topically, at least, uh, some of the, uh, at least some of the 52 pieces of evidence, um, presented by Bugliosi, uh, as J J JFK being the assassin, uh, the assassin, the lone assassin, uh, f uh, of JFK. Now, for those of you who don't know the whole story, uh, the, basically the, the the short version of the story is Lee Harvey Oswald was a former uh, Marine sharpshooter. He was later demoted as a marksman because he, he actually started declining in his ability. Um, who was constantly court-martialed and demoted because he keeps, you know, firing his his weapon into into bushes. He shot himself on in on accident with a twenty two. He got in a fight with his superior officer. Uh, he was a very disturbed person. Um, uh, on top of the fact that he was a Marxist, like he was a Marxist and he was also disturbed for other reasons. Um, he was an avowed Marxist who hated everything about America and everything it stood for. And he wanted to destroy so that he can live in a communist paradise. Um, he became a you know, uh, U.S. expatriate, uh, expatriated to the USSR, which he found out that it sucks there and moved back. Uh, and while he was there, he brought back his uh, new wife. Um, what was her name? Marina. So they moved back to the United States, and uh, he was a very 
disturbed person again was beating his wife and they had like kind of like a relationship where they were kind of uh, on again off again like he would he would beat her she would she would leave she would come back to him uh, he would apologize they would get back together um and so i guess so what happened was one night um or no getting too far ahead of myself um in 1963, earlier 1963, the year that Kennedy was assassinated, in March, he attempted to assassinate General Edward Walker, who was a uh, John Bircher. Uh, he was an anti-communist who also spread a lot of anti-communist propaganda, uh, which I'm all for. <laughs> he tried to assassinate him, but um, while they were while they were indicting him, uh, deciding whether or not he was going to be indicted for, for the murder, uh, he was placed in a mental institution because they found out this guy was a lunatic. Uh, they decided they didn't have enough evidence for it uh, because they could not link the six, uh, 6.5 millimeter ca- uh, caliber uh, Manic Connell rifle to the bullet that they shot because uh, it had no, uh, I guess they didn't, weren't sure. So he bought this, this Manic Connell rifle and a pistol. He bought the Manic for like 30 bucks and then bought a uh, 38 as well. Uh, there's also a picture that you can see of him holding the rifle and, and the gun and a, and a picture of a, uh, of a communist newspaper, which he says later said it was a superimposed. Um, but he also then used that same gun after they couldn't indict him on that. They had no suspects in the case afterwards. Uh, they ended up concluding that it was him. They actually could trace the bullets back to him after they knew he had that gun. Uh, so he took that same gun that he tried to uh, assassinate the general with and went on in on, on November twenty second, nineteen sixty three, uh, at his place of work at the Book Depository Building. Uh, he shot five, three shots out of the window, uh, two of which uh, hitting and killing the president, and one of those straying out of out of him, and uh, passing through Governor Connolly, who was in the front seat of the uh, uh, in front seated in front of him in the limo. He then fled in desperation and shot uh, and killed the police officer, J.D. Tippett, when he noticed Oswald fitting the description of the assassin over the radio. Uh, He was then captured at a theater. Um, He then told uh, a series of provable lies uh, to the police while being interrogated. uh, And then while being transferred, he was murdered by Jack Ruby, a local nightclub owner who was very fond of Kennedy. So much so that, like, he was actually crying more when he heard that Kennedy died than when he found out that his parents died. This is how much he loved him. And he thought that he would be like praised as a hero if he murdered him. All right. So that's basically kind of what happened uh, <laughs> and the kind of the story behind it. So uh, let's talk about some of the 53 pieces of evidence. Well, first of all, um, whenever Oswald had uh, his friend Wes- uh, Wesley Fraser drive him out uh, to visit his wife and daughters, he'd go on a Friday evening and retor- return to Dallas on Monday morning. Uh, the assassination was on Friday, November 22nd, and for the very first time, Oswald went to Irving with Fraser on the Thursday evening, November 21st, obviously to pick up his gun, the command clerk cannon rifle, which he used for the following day. Um, now, Oswald, the second piece, number two, Oswald said that he was going to Irving to pick up some curtain rods for his apartment on Dallas. Now, everybody who knew him said that that wasn't true. Um, no one mentioned this anything from this. Uh, the, pe- the people who took the the picture of um, <clears throat> the people who took the picture of his apartment afterwards noticed that the that the the curtain rods were fine. His landlady said like he should never mentioned anything about curtain rods. Um, the, uh, the 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 their friend also said that that you know the curtain rods were still there at her house uh, that he never came and picked them up. Um, he said no one. Uh, the, the people who he said he had uh, curtain rods with him or p- people who saw him leave later that day, um, the bus, uh, the cab driver and Erlene Roberts all said that none, none of them said that he had curtain rods uh, when he left the book depository building. Uh, there was no there was no uh, curtain rods found on the grassy knoll. Um, there was also no no bullets or casings found on the grassy knoll. Um, yeah, so that was crap. So, but in addition to the evidence showing that Oswald's curtains rod story was a total fabrication, the story itself uh, is inherently implausible. If Oswald did not pick up the curtain rods at Ruth Payne's home uh, for the apartment, why would he require them to? Why would? Why would that require him to go there on a Thursday evening? Could he only pick them up if they were there on a Thursday evening and not a Friday evening? When Oswald told number three, when Oswald told 
Fraser why he was coming to Irvine that uh, why he was coming to Irvine that Thursday night to pick up curtain rods. Fraser said to Oswald, "Oh no, uh, oh very well," and then added, "Will you be going with uh, home with me tomorrow also?" Which he replied, "No." Uh, Oswald and his uh, his wife Maria had a really interesting conversations about Oswald. They really enjoyed t- uh, not st- talking about Kennedy with uh, her, his wife and Oswald. They used to talk about Kennedy all the time. And the night of the assassination, the night before, the evening before the assassination, there was no talk about this at all. Like anytime she was mentioning, like, oh, you know, that Kennedy's coming to town. You know, like we, you know, you like Kennedy, you like talking about Kennedy so much and how much you hate him and everything. Like now that he's actually coming to town, like we should actually talk about this. And he was just interested in just changing the subject, changing the subject. Uh, and she thought that was very peculiar. Um, the Friday morning uh, when he left uh, Ruth Payne's house. Um, she, he left his wedding ring and $170 and told her to go buy stuff for the, for the kids and whatever else they needed. And she thought that was very weird because he never let her spend money and he was very frugal with money. Uh, this was also, uh, believed to be, uh, his entire net worth is $170 in 1960s money. Now, before Oswald got into the car that Friday morning or the day of the assassination, he placed a long bulky package near the rear seat, telling Fraser it contained the curtain rods. Wesley Fraser said, uh, number seven, Wesley Fraser said that uh, on his way to work uh, the morning of the assassination, he noticed for the first time that he did not bring his lunch. Oswald did not bring his lunch. When, uh, number eight, when they got to the book depository building, uh, he took he took the, the alleged curtain rods out of the back seat and uh, darted to the front door uh, 50, 50, uh, 50 feet or so in front of him. Now, normally when they walk to the office, or what book to the depository building together? They walked together. Um, he was in a in a, dr- a very big hurry uh, to get inside. Um, you know, every morning uh, Oswald would go to the Don Mono room for the first floor of the building and read the previous uh, morning's edition of the Dallas Morning News, which another employee, another employee had brought in on the morning of the assassination. For the first time, he did not do this. Um, now. There was a lot of news and kerfluffle going on about the fact that Kennedy was showing up. It was in all the newspapers, all the radio, all the TV, uh, and Oswald was known to read read the read the news. He was very politically active, very very politically aware of what was going on. Um, and about somewhere between nine thirty and ten o'clock in the morning of the assassination, while people were gathering around the corner of Houston and Elm, he kept asking questions like, you know, like, where's Kennedy coming from? Uh, you know, do you know which way he's coming? Um, now, obviously, Oswald was trying to create the false impression. He had he uh, knew nothing about the president's visit. And if not, he was just too, um, if not, these were just two nervous, pointless questions about by someone who knew he was about to change history. Um, number, uh, number 11. Now, when shots were heard at, in Dealey Plaza, um, there was a guy named Howard Brennan who was sitting on a concrete wall, saw Oswald in the window firing the weapon, firing the last uh, shot. Um, he was only 120 feet away from Oswald, and he, uh, he watched in horror as he, as he saw uh, Oswald fire the last shot. He positively pointed him out. Now, there were some problems with this because when he was asked to do a lineup, he said... Um, Quote, he looks like him, but I can't positively say giving him reason, uh, you know, and he said that he he told the police the reason why he couldn't give a positive action uh, description is that he's seen uh, his picture on the news and that messed him up. Uh, Later, uh, he signed an affidavit uh, saying that he was absolutely sure that it was uh, him. And then he ended up telling the FBI that he the reason why he said that he was unsure that he couldn't be 100 percent positive was because he was in fear that if he was, in fact, the person who identified him as the murderer, that him and his family would be in danger. Um, Although Brennan did not positively identify Oswald in the lineup, he did say, as we've seen, that Oswald looked up, uh, looked like the man. He gave the description, which the same description that was given over the police radio, which was used to identify him. 
Number 12, apart from Brennan, we know that Kennedy's assassin was uh, the subject sixth floor window. Among the evidence was the rifle that was used to murder Kennedy. It was found at the sixth floor of the book depository building. Witnesses other than Brennan saw a rifle sticking out of the southwesternmost window on the sixth floor. A sniper's nest was uh, found around the subject window and three cartridge, casing, cartridge casings for the murder weapon were found on the floor and beneath the window. Uh, number 13. Um... Here we have uh, the 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 uh, thing about the uh, what is this? This is about the uh, okay the f- the fact that uh, th- that he was uh, the okay so this is the one about the uh, him going up and down the the uh, the, the first room floor. Uh, so this is this is a big thing that the conspiracy theorists like to talk about. So I'm going to kind of touch on it briefly. There's a lot here. Um, Oh God, this is going to be tough. <laughs> it's kind of tough to summarize. Okay, so uh, Oswald claimed to be on the first floor uh, of 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 the uh, of the book. I'll just I'll just read it. Fuck it. Although the, his interrogation on the Friday afternoon, November twenty second, Oswald said that he was having lunch on the first floor of the book depository building at the time of the assassination. During the Sunday's interrogation, Oswald slipped up and placed himself on the sixth floor of, at the time of the assassination, making him the only employee of the book depository building who placed himself on the sixth floor or was placed there by anybody else. At the time, we know. Uh, the assassin shot Kennedy from the sixth floor. In his Sunday morning interrogation, he said at the lunchtime that one of the, quote, Negro, not my quote, uh, unquote, employees in, uh, invited him up to eat lunch with them and he declined. You, he said, quote, you go down to uh, you go down and send one, uh, send the elevator back up and I will join you in a few minutes. He said before he could finish whatever he was doing, the commonplace, uh, the commotion surrounding the assassination took place and then he went downstairs. Policemen questioned him as to the identification, uh, questioned him as to his identification, and his boss said that he was one of the employees. Later, the uh, the later confrontation, of course, refers to uh, Officer Marin Baker in Roy's Truly's presence. Uh, Talking to Oswald, one of the second floor, uh, talking to Oswald in the second floor lunchroom within two minutes of the shooting, where Oswald was, uh, where Oswald was at the time of the. Uh, where was Oswald at the time the Negro employee invited him to lunch and before he descended to the sixth floor lunchroom? The sixth floor. Charles Givens testified at 1155 that he went up to the sixth floor to get his jacket and cigarette and saw that Oswald was on the sixth floor. He answered, boy, are you going downstairs? It's near lunchtime. Oswald answered, no, sir. When you get downstairs, close the gate to the elevator. There's another powerful reason why we know that Oswald at the time of this uh, confrontation with Bar, uh, Baker at uh, the second uh, in the second floor lunchroom, he had just came down from the sixth floor and not from the first floor as he claimed. Uh, this has much to do with the fact that he was getting a Coca Coca Cola from the Coca Cola machine, which was alleged by by his creator. But the problem is, is, there actually was a Dr Pepper machine in the building, and Dr Pepper uh, Dr Pepper was his preferred drink of choice. Um, so Wesley Fraser. Uh, <laughs> Uh, says that he, uh, at the, when he testified for me in the London trial, still living in Dallas, where he told me that there was a Dr. Pepper machine on the first floor. Where specifically was it? Um, it was located by the double freight elevator near the back of the building. Uh, there was a lot of dispute with this, I guess. Um, so there was also a picture of it, and I'm trying to find the relevant part of this. Um, uh, here we go. Um, people saying that most people got drinks out of the out of the Dr Pepper machine because it also had root beer and orange orange soda in it as well. Um, we had, okay, so Fraser said he could not not say whether or not he went to the second floor to get a Coke or ever drank soft drinks other than Dr. Pepper. Quote, I only re- recall seeing him with Dr. Pepper. Author Jim Bishop explains in his book, The Day Kennedy Was Shot, writes, without citation, however, that Oswald invariably, invari- in, uh, invariably drank Dr. Pepper. And we know that Marina told her biographer, Priscilla McMillan, that when he was working at Jaggers, Chili's, and Stovall in Dallas in 1963, after supper, he would walk down to the street, buy a newspaper, and a bottle of Dr. Pepper. Um, so we see from a part that all the conclusive evidence that Oswald shot Kennedy from the sniper's nest and therefore had descended down there uh, to the second floor, his story about going up to the second floor to get a Coke doesn't make any sense. Why go up to the second floor to get a drink from your, for your lunch 
when there's a soft drink machine on the first floor, the, f- the floor you say you were already on, particularly when the apparent drink of choice is on the first floor and not the second floor. All right, so number 14. That's all right, that, one's, that one's a big one. <laughs> the, so there was yet another reason why uh, Oswald's statement that he was on the first floor eating lunch at the time of the commo- uh, shooting makes no sense at all. If he had been, once he had heard shots sc- and screaming and all the commotion outside, if he was innocent, what was the likelihood that he would have proceeded to go, as he claimed, up to the second floor to get himself a Coke? How would this make sense to any person? How... Could this make uh, any sensible person believe a story like that? All right. So Os- number 15, Oswald was probably more politically oriented than all 13 of the other warehouse men in the book dep- in the book depository building put together. If you were to believe that Oswald's story, he was the only person who had no interest whatsoever about the motorcades or any of the things that were going on outside of the book depository building. Indeed, if Oswald, the political enemy that he was, why was he so uninterested and the fact that the most powerful politician on the face of the planet, the one he was most interested in, had been shot, had he had no inclination to stick around for a few minutes and engage in conversation with his coworkers about the tragic events. Does that make any sense? No. Number 16. After the shooting, uh, they did a roll call and found out there was only two employees that did not make the make, uh make the roll call, which was Lee Harvey Oswald and Charles Givens. And Givens was shortly found shortly found afterwards. Uh, he was the only person to not be accounted for. Number 17, after exiting the front door of the book depository building, if Oswald hadn't just murdered uh, the president, uh, why did he not take the Berkeley bus, which he normally took home every day, the, the bus that drops him off in his, in his house? Instead, he walked past that and, uh, and, and found a bus, which was the... Marcellus bus. Now, the Marcellus bus only uh, dropped him off uh, half a mile from his house and not his house uh, exactly. So when the Marcellus, number 18, when the Marcellus bus had boarded uh, he, and got snarled in traffic, Oswald just got off after a few blocks. Then again, demonstrating that he was uh, in, in flight from a serious scene of a crime, as, uh, as, as number 17 would indicate, too. Why would he stick around? Uh, or why would he walk towards another bus that he wasn't getting to that wasn't going to bring him directly to his house unless he was trying to leave as fast as he could, not hanging around at a bus stop um, again? And then when the bus stop got snarled in traffic, he ran. Uh, this is uh, even though this is circumstantial evidence, this is definitely evidence of a, a consciousness of guilt. Uh, Oswald got in a cab Um and when when he got in the cab, the uh, the cabbie asked him, "I wonder what all the hell is all this uproar for?" And Oswald said nothing. Now, Oswald had just came from the scene of the assassination, and he said absolutely nothing when asked, <laughs> "What was the hell is all this uproar for?" Now, if you were in this cabbie, and uh, if you were in this cab, and this cabbie asked you a question like, "Hey, what's all this uproar for?" and you were completely innocent of a crime, would you not say anything, or would you say like, "Oh yeah, the president's got assassinated. I was just over there." <sighs> Number twenty-one. While uh, entering the room of his house about one o'clock the day of the assassination, per the testimony of the housekeeper Erlene Roberts, who we mentioned before, um, he seemed to be walking unusually fast. He was all but running. Uh, he asked, like, oh, are you in a hurry? He did not respond. Um, you sure look like you're in a hurry. He just didn't say anything. He just ran in his room, grabbed, grabbed a short tan coat, and ran back out. Let me get a drink real quick. Ah. Oswald picked up his revolver from the rooming house, not a normal thing unless he felt like he needed to protect himself and <laughs> in light of some terrible act he had just committed. When he was asked about it, he lame, questioned about it when he was interrogated. He says, oh, you know how boys do when they have a gun? They just carry it. Oh. Well, what is a libertarian? So we can't. <laughs> uh, and number 23, in addition to picking up his revolver at the rooming house, Oswald changed his trousers. So Oswald changed his clothing to hide his identity. Number 24. Um, 45 minutes after the shooting in Dealey Plaza, out of the... Th- out of the close to three quarters of a million people in Dallas, he was the only one to uh, he, he was the only one to just happen to murder a police officer, J.D. Tippett, on the near uh, near the patent at the Oak Cliff area. Now, there was ten people, ten eyewitnesses to his murder. 
10 eyewitnesses. Now, conspiracists will like to tell you that there are there was there was only one person who saw him, but that's not true. There was 10 people who saw him commit the murder and saw him fleeing the murder after after uh, they noticed that the cop was cop was murdered and seen him running away with the gun. 10 people. I want to know has there ever been a crime in the history of the world where there have been 10 <laughs> 10 witnesses to a murder and people start to doubt that. Okay? Now th- this is this is um this is uh Vincent, he says, I argue to the jury in London that Oswald's responsibility for Kennedy's assassination explains and explains why he was driven to Officer uh, Tippett. The murder bore the signature of a man, I argued, in desperate flight from some awful deed. What other reason under the moon would he have to kill Officer Tippett? It should be noted that if even if we assume for the sake of argument that Oswald did not murder Officer Tippett, then who who in the world did the conspiracy uh, community never says, although we know why uh, Oswald would have reason to kill Tippett. What other possible reason would this fancier have, have done this? All right. All right. So number 25, within minutes of the murder of Tippett, the manager of the st- shoe station uh, noticed him, saw him uh, after, after hearing. Okay. So he heard about what happened. He heard the sirens. He heard the radio uh, description of the shooting. He heard the description of of Oswald uh, and saw a man hide in the recesses of the store sidewalk, stand with his back against to the street. After the sirens uh, sirens faded off, the man looked over his shoulder, turned around, walked up down the uh, down the street, and ran towards the Texas theater. The shoe manager uh, positively identified the man uh, and followed him to the theater. Number 26, the cashier of the theater said that Oswald had ducked in uh, to the theater without buying a ticket. He then called the number 27. He then called the police and said that the man had had uh, ran into the theater uh, without paying. Um, the officer told Oswald to stand up and then Oswald arose and said, well, it's all over now. What else could he have possibly meant by that? <sighs> number 28, it's all over now. Uh, after saying it's all over now, Oswald then immediately struck the officer in the face uh, and then drew his loaded revolver. And then there was a scuffle and then he was placed under arrest. If Oswald had not just murdered Kennedy and Tippett, why wouldn't he have been likely, uh, why wouldn't he, uh, why not only wouldn't he, excuse me, I'm getting a little little frustrated about, <laughs> about, about this shit. Okay, so not only would he, have not been likely to have loaded uh, have a loaded revolver on him, but there wouldn't have been any reason for him to draw that resol- uh, all, uh, all that revolver on an officer, arresting officer, and strike him. And he wasn't libertarian, so uh, <laughs> if this was if this was an innocent person, uh, is this what an innocent person normally does when a police officer approaches to arrest him? Is to pull a gun on him and physically uh, resist arrest, or does he say the words in effect, "What's going on? I have no idea what's going on. Why are you doing this to me? Am I being detained? Or whatever." Number twenty nine. After Oswald's arrest at the Texas Theater, he refused to give him uh, even his name. The Dallas police officers who captured him. Now, to the Dallas police officers who captured him, uh, it's a pretty consistent rule that whenever a person is innocent of a crime, usually usually uh, cooperates in law enforcement unless he's a libertarian, uh, which he's not. He's a communist. Number 30, while being detained by Dallas de- uh, detectives, uh, he he held up his hand in a f- uh, f- clenched fist salute of some nature. One would expect an innocent person to have an expression on his face conve- conveying bewilderment or angerness or a plea for help, not a, hey, yeah. Uh, Instead, it's clear that Oswald is making some sort of statement by his clenched fist. Now, um, if not, if you ask yourself how many people were charged with the murder they did not uh, to a murder they did not commit, would respond in the way that uh, he did with a clenched fist salute. One out of a thousand, one out of a million, what? All right, so number 31, when asked... Oswald refused to take a lie detector test. Uh, by contrast, Ruby volunteered to take one. Ruby was the uh, person who uh, shot Kennedy, as we've been over before. Uh, in view of the all the other evidence of Oswald's guilt, refusal to take a lie detector test, though not certainly conclusive, I would not take a take it, even if I did or didn't <laughs> do anything wrong. They're, they're bullshit, but uh, it does kind of show yet another piece of evidence that he uh, that he had a guilty conscience. All right, number thirty-two. No one knew Oswald more than his wife Marina. 
Now, Marina, uh, after the assassination, uh, it, it admitted <laughs> that she uh, that she could see in his eyes that he was guilty. Um, she testified uh, that he was the one that did it. And I have no doubt in my mind that Lee Harvey Oswald killed President Ken- Kennedy. All right, so now for the physical evidence. Uh, a Manica Connor rifle, the serial number C2766, was found on the uh, sixth floor of the book depository building shortly after the shooting in Daly Plaza. Handwritten, uh, handwriting experts determined that the writing on the purchase order and the money order for the rifle was Oswald's, and the seller shipped the uh, rifle to Oswald's post office box in Dallas. So Oswald owned the Kakano. Also, photographs taken by Oswald's wife, which I mentioned earlier, Marina, on April of 1963 show Oswald holding the Kakano. Oswald's right palm was also found on the underside of the rifle, <clears throat> underside of the rifle uh, follow, uh, following the assassination. So we know that Oswald not only owned the gun, but possessed, uh, but possessed the subject rifle. In the same vein, a tuft of several fresh dark blue, gray and black and yellow cotton fibers were found in a crevice between the butt plate and the Kakano wooden stock. The FBI laboratory found the colors and even the twist of the fibers were perfectly matched by the ones in Oswald's shirt. Uh, Oswald the shirt that Oswald was wearing at the time of the arrest. Though such fibers could theoretically come from some I- other identical shirt, the, prohibif- the prohib- prohibif- ah, prohibitive probability that it came from some, uh, that it came from uh, Oswald's shirt. Number 34, identification experts from the Warren Commission and the HSCA concluded that two large bullet fragments found in the presidential limousines were parts of the bullets fired from Oswald's rifle. Uh, likewise, firearms experts also agreed uh, that the bullet recovered from the stretcher of the Parkland uh, bullet, the whole bullet recovered from the stretcher at the Parkland uh, Hospital, uh, believed to be the stretcher uh, Governor Colony was on when fired from Oswald's rifle uh, to the exclusion of all other weapons. Uh, firearms experts determined that three of the expended numbers 35 ex- uh, <laughs> expended cartridges shells f- found on the floor beneath the southeasternmost window of the sixth floor of the book depository building were fired and ejected from Oswald's Manica Kakano rifle to the exclusion of all other weapons. So we know just so not just beyond a, beyond a reasonable doubt, but by, beyond all doubt, that Oswald's rifle was a murder weapon. Um, if there was no other evidence against Oswald, the fact that the murder weapon belonged to him and that there was no evidence or even likelihood that anybody else had come into possession of that, of that weapon would be devastating evidence of this guilt. But likewise, it should be realized that even if, hypothetically, Oswald had succeeded in uh, secreting his weapon and uh, succeeded in secreting his weapon and law enforcement never found it and hence the murder weapon could never be connected with them as we can see from all the preceding pages of those uh, guilt that follows that the evidence against him would still be much more than enough to prove his guilt beyond all doubt uh let's see number 36 a large ha- uh, brown handmade bag of wrapping paper and tape the appropriate size contain, uh, containing Oswald's disassembled Kakano rifle was undoubtedly the bag that Wesley Fraser saw uh, Oswald carry. And also, Oswald's left index finger and right palm print were found on the bag. Number 37, Oswald's left palm print and right index finger were found on the on top of the book cotton uh, book carton next to the windowsill of the southeasternmost window of the book depository building. The carton appeared to be arranged in the, in the uh, as the convenient gun rest. Both prints were pointing in a southeasternly direction, the same direction the presidential limousine was proceeding down Elm Street. A print of the right palm was also found on the northwest corner carton, uh, was the, uh, near the gun rest carton. Uh, the, resol- the revolver in Oswald's possession at the time of his arrest at the Texas Theater was a Smith & Wesson uh, 30, uh, 38 <laughs> a special caliber revolver, serial number V10210. Handwriting experts found that the mail order coupon for the revolver contained the handwriting of Lee Harvey Oswald. The seller and the seller of the revolver sent it to Oswald's P.O. box in Dallas. Uh, the four 
bullets recovered from the body of Officer Tippett, a firearms identification expert for the Warren Commission, concluded that one of the four bullets was fired from Oswald's revolver to the exclusion of all other weapons, and all other experts acknowledge that all four bullets could have been fired from the revolver since the bullets recovered from Tippett at the same general characteristics that those... Uh, Excuse me. Since the bullets recovered from Tippett had the same general general characteristics as those fired from Oswald's revolver, uh, f- five lands and grooves, including the same widths and lands of the grooves, uh, with the right twist. Um, they're all thirty. They all were thirty-eight special bullets. Number forty. Four expended case, uh, cartridge cases were found near the site of Tippett's killing. The firearm experts of the Warren's Commission and the HEA all concluded that they were all ejected from Oswald, Smith, and Wesson revolver, to the exclusion of all other weapons. Um, where is it? Uh, in, in a city with more than 700,000 people, what is the probability of one of them being the owner and possessor of a weapon that murdered Kennedy and Tippett and yet still be innocent of both murders. Aren't we talking about DNA numbers here? Like one out of several billion trillion? Is there a mathematician in the house? Number 41, the Dallas police performed a paraffin test on Oswald's hands at the time of the interrogation to determine if he had recently fired a revolver. And the results were positive. Number 42, the Oswald had left the book depository building within minutes of shooting uh, the shooting of Dealey Plaza. He left in his blue uh, jacket behind, the, the jacket being found December 6, 1963, excuse me, in a depressed area beneath the windowsill in the domino room in the first floor. Maria uh, Marina Oswald identified the jacket as one of the two that he owned, the other being a light-colored gray jacket. Several brown hairs found inside of the blue jacket had the same microscopic characteristics as a sample of the hair taken from Oswald, leaving one's jacket behind, particularly Oswald, as Oswald did, uh, where Oswald did, can only go in the direction that, though he, not conclusively, in a conscience of guilt, not innocence. 43. We got 10 more to go, guys. <laughs> like, I know this is, I'm painting the overwhelming evidence against Oswald, okay? So bear with me here. When Oswald left his rooming house about 10 o'clock on the day of the assassination, the housekeeper noticed that he was zipping up his jacket, which he had not, uh, which he had not been wearing a few minutes earlier when he arrived at the rooming house. When he was arrested around 45 minutes later, he did not have a jacket. Shortly after Tippett's murder and after Oswald was seen running towards uh, the rear of the Texaco gas station on Jefferson Boulevard, police found a light-colored jacket with a zipper under one of the cars in the parking lot behind the gas station. The last time that anyone saw Oswald before he appeared at the Texas Theater, when Mary Brock, the then-wife of the employee of the gas station owner, saw him wearing a light-colored jacket walk past her, into the parking lot uh, at a at a fast pace. Marina Oswald later identified the jacket as being the second one her husband owned. What is additionally damning is that Oswald, uh, what is additionally damning to Oswald is that the jacket was found along the path from 10th and Patton, south of uh, on uh, south on Patton to Jefferson, uh, then right or west on Jefferson, with a slight detour behind the gas station. Uh, uh, then to the Texas Theater. We know the officer. Uh, we know that the murderer of Officer Tippett took uh, after after the slang. Uh, finally, the dark blue, uh, the, finally the dark blue, gray, black, and orange yellow cotton fibers were found on the inside of the sleeves of the jacket, and their microscopic characteristic of those on the dark blue, gray, black, and orange yellow cotton fibers. Uh, composing of the brownish shirt that Oswald was wearing at the time of his arrest. 44. Oswald's clipboard was found on the sixth floor of the assassination. Orders for Scott's Foreman and Company books were on the clipboard, all dated November 22, 1963. Oswald had not filled any of those orders. Oswald owned the word during his investigation. I, I told the jury in London, this is, uh, again, this is uh, 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 um, Bugliosi's uh words here. I told the jury in London that during his interrogation, Oswald fired from his own lips that, uh, that Oswald from his own lips told us that he was guilty. Uh, he almost at the same time as if, 
at the same time as if he said, I murdered President Kennedy. How, Al, uh, how did he tell, uh, tell us? Well, the lies he told. He told one after another. He showed un, an unmistakable conscience of guilt. Oswald tried very hard to lie his way out of the quickly developing evidence against him. Let's look at some of the most important lies he told, each of which alone by itself is evidence of, of his guilt. If he were not innocent, why would he have any reason to tell any one of these lies? More, than, uh, more often than not, in a criminal case, this means that a criminal is empl- uh, that it, the means of a criminal uh, employs to conceal his guilt, here Oswald's word, are the precise means to reveal his culpability. Number 45. Oswald lied when he denied purchasing the Kakana rifle from Klein's Sporting Goods Company in Chicago. He even de- uh, denied owning or any rifle at all. Since Oswald knew that he had killed Kennedy with that Kakano ri- rifle, he knew that he had no choice but to deny the rifle was his. Um... Number 46, when Oswald was shown a backyard photograph of himself holding the Mimatic Kakano rifle, he lied and said that he was not holding the rifle, but that someone superimposed his face on the body. Number 47, he also lied when he'd never seen the photograph before, even though the handwriting experts concluded that it was Oswald's handwriting on the back of the copy of the photograph that he found in his personal effects. Uh, number 48, Oswald uh, consciously tried to distance himself from the murder weapon, so much so that he apparently even went... To the following extreme, he, he and Marina and their daughter lived in uh, lived at the apartment on Elba Street in Dallas for exactly nine months, and then moved to the apartment on Neely Street for close to two months. However, when he was asked to furnish all the previous residents since he return uh, since his return from Russia at the approximate time he lived at each, he gave all of them, including the residents at Fort Worth and New Orleans, that uh, with with no. Uh, he gave all of, all of them, um, with one notable exception, he omitted any reference to the Neely residence, the residence, of course, where he knew his wife had photographed him at the time of the murder in the backyard, with the murder weapon in the backyard. He clearly accounted for close to two months. Uh, he, uh, he cleverly accounted for the two months uh, that, at the Neely by saying that he lived, uh, he only lived, by saying he lived seven months at one residence, um, and uh, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. So, again, this also shows that he has a consciousness of guilt. He's lying. All right, number 49, Oswald denied telling Wesley Fraser the reason he came to Irving in the f- on that Thursday night was to get shower rods or get the curtain rods for his Dallas apartment. Why do I keep saying shower rods? Number 50, he also denied putting any kind of long package in the back of ba- uh, the backseat of Fraser's car on the morning of the assassination, saying he only brought a cheese sandwich and some fruit to, to work with him. But unfortunately for Oswald, not only did Fraser see him put the long package in the car, but Fraser's sister, Lily May Rendell, also saw him put a package into his car. Oswald also denied carrying any kind of long package to the book depository building, which Fraser saw him do. He also denied uh, telling Fraser that the curtain rods were for uh, inside the large... Uh, the, yeah, he also denied telling Fraser that curtain rods were inside of the large bag. Uh, Warren Commission critics and defenders of Oswald have always steadfastly maintained that the brown paper bag was too short f- to contain even the disassembled Kakano. But if the Kakano was not in the bag at the time at, uh, at the Fraser, but if the Kakano was not in the bag that Fraser and his sister uh, saw on Os- uh, Oswald placed in the back seat, then something was uh, and something was and something non incriminating was instead. Uh, of lying and saying that he never placed a large bag in or any other bag in the back seat, why didn't Oswald just admit that he was placed uh, placing the bag there and just simply tell him what was in the bag? Number fifty one, Oswald told Fritz that the only thing he brought to work in the morning was his lunch. But we know that from Fr- uh, know that Fraser said that the only th- uh, noticed that it was the only day that Oswald did not bring his lunch. Number fifty two, Oswald told Fritz that. At the time of uh, the president was shot, he was the uh, he was having lunch on the first floor with quote Junior, uh, which is uh, James Jarman Junior. And another employee did not identify, but Jarman testified that he did have lunch with Oswald and that he ate alone. And number fifty three, Oswald told Fritz 
that he had bought his 30, 38 uh, caliber Smith & Wesson revolver from Fort Worth, uh, 105, uh, excuse me, when he actually purchased it from a mail order, uh, from a mail order house in Los Angeles. All right, so that was that was the fifty two pieces of evidence that Bugliosi provides in his book, um, and I'm gonna link, post a link below in the book. Um, it's got my advertiser code because you know I'm a greedy bastard, but whatever. But you know, in it, it, it kind of goes through some of it. Now I can't go through every single big piece of evidence. I can't do it. It's it's too fucking much. Okay. Uh, but I'm going to go over some of the ones, and I'm going to go over the one that I believed because I believed in the in the worst one of all, which is that the that the driver uh, killed JFK. Now, Bill Cooper, who I I think I mentioned earlier, Bill Cooper, um, who was a conspiracy nut job, he was also a con artist, an alcoholic, wife beating piece of shit. Uh, but that's that's besides the point. Uh, he he knew that this one this was wrong. Uh, and he knew it, but he was peddling it anyway. And what he did is he got a bad copy of this Zapruder film and showed it like, oh, this is the unedited version. This is the uh, the one before they cleaned it up and make it look like something else. Uh, where he claims that that the driver is the one who shot JFK. And what happens is once you start getting into the the, the part where it's the assassination has happened or the, the, the final bullet struck JFK and his head exploded, it looks as though... The driver is turning around, aiming a gun and firing it at him, uh, sort of. But it's really bad quality. But if you can find yourself a bad quality of the Zapruder film on YouTube and you're looking at it with that idea in your head, it really kind of does look that way. And so it, it's kind of it'll, it'll fool you. But then once you kind of get like a better version of it, you quickly notice that it's it's the, the reflection of the pomade in the in the dry passenger sides. Uh, thing, and it's funny is because that people that will defend Bill Cooper in the face of all the evidence of how much of a wife beating fraud that guy is, uh, will turn around. A lot of the times, will say, "Yeah, but the JFK thing was was kind of dumb. I don't know why he was peddling that." So, I mean, the the answer to that is just just find a decent, just a decent. It doesn't have to be a great copy, but a decent copy of the Zapruder film, uh, the film that shows JFK getting assassinated. If you know what that is, uh, recorded by Abraham Zapruder. Just get any decent copy of the Zapruder film and then look at it. You'll be like, oh, no, it's just a reflection of his hair. All right. All right. So the other thing they like like they like they to point out is the head going back into the left, back into the left. We know that from the JFK film. Like, why did the head go to the back if he was shot uh, – go back if he was shot from the back? Wouldn't it go towards the front? Um, you know, if you look at the Zapruder film and the fire uh, – the the fatal blow, uh, <clears throat> the, f- the final and fatal blow from, from, from the uh, – uh, whatever uh, shows his head going forward and, you know, blood squirting out everywhere. It looks like he was shot from the front. Uh, and that was the, that was the entrance wound, not the exit wound. Now, the problem is, is if you look at it from that perspective, if you're just watching the film, it does look like he's getting shot from the front. But if you actually look at it frame by frame, you will see that the initial impact comes from the back and he goes forward uh, and then shoots back. Now this is in frame three twelve to three thirteen. If you if you look between those two, you can see his head getting impacted by the bullet at first and going forward. And it's not until after the bullet exits the skull that you see him jerk back. And that's caused by one, uh, not one of two reasons, by by two reasons. One, the head is tilted back because of a vacuum that's created inside of the head. You have a small hole going in the back of the head and um, a big hole going into uh, coming out the front. Now, when the bullet goes in, it's going to create uh, a suction. It's going to create a vacuum uh, where all your brain and everything is just going to swirl around and, and create a vacuum. And then it's going to try to suck into that little hole. But as soon as it creates that exit wound, it's going to favor the path of least resistance and go uh, and exit out the front, creating a jet stream and pushing the head back. Now, the reason why you see the you also will see the body jerk back as well. And that's because, well, you're hitting the central nervous system and the nervous system, as soon as it kind of feels any kind of pain, is to kind of jerk back. That's your kind of instinctual reaction. So you have the, the fact that the, the central nervous system is being attacked. And, and then you also have the, uh, the vacuum, which is going to cause the head to tilt back as well. So that's what it kind of, kind of creates like a twofold thing to push the body back. But initially, when the, when the, when the bullet enters the head, the head pushes forward. As you would expect from bullet, so yeah, and again, that's frame twelve, uh, three twelve, and three thirteen. 
Now, this is from Slate, and I, I know it's fucking Slate. I know it's fucking Slate, uh, <laughs> but uh, Slate kind of condensed this down really well. So the, uh, the acoustical analysis. In, the 19, in 1976, a House representative formed a special committee to reinvestigate the Kennedy assassination. After many years and hearings and uh, many hearings and extensive analysis, the panel concluded that there had been a second shooter after all. The surprise conclusion was based on newly discovered piece of evidence, an audio tape from the audio uh, audio transmission from the Dallas policeman uh, from a Dallas policeman who had been escorting JFK's motorcade. The according to the House report. The acoustical analysis of the tape revealed that four gunshots were fired and that given the echo patterns of the officer's location, that only one of those shots came from the grassy knoll, that one of those shots came from the grassy knoll. The report stirred such a commotion that the National Academy of Sciences conducted its own analysis of the tape and concluded that the House report was hooey. First, it turned out that some um, that some of the. Excuse me. First, it turned out that some of the four gunshot like sounds were not gunshots. Uh, secondly, the motorcade um, cop in the in question was not uh, in, was not where the house uh, report claimed. So even if the sounds had uh, been gunshots, the revised echo analysis put them someplace other than the grassy knoll. Third, even if some sounds were uh, on the tape have occurred uh, occurred a min, uh, occurred a minute after the assassination. Case closed. Another claim the conspiracies like uh, excuse me <clears throat> the the conspiracists like to point out is that the Manlicher Kakano rifle the Manlicher Kakano rifle that um, that Oswald had was not very accurate um, and that there's no way that he could be that accurate from that far away. Well, first of all, he really was not that far away. It was only 175 feet to 265 feet um, for a sniper rifle. And he was a, he was a marksman, right? We can agree that he was in the, he was in the military as a as, as a marksman. Uh, he was at a time where he actually was designated a sharpshooter. But the FBI te uh, tests of the uh, Kikano's accuracy uh, showed that the um, that it was a very accurate weapon, and the targets and uh, quote it was a very accurate weapon, and the targets we fired showed that from 15 yards, all three bullets uh, in the testing landed approximately two and a half inches high and one uh, inch uh, to the right. Uh, and the more you got out, the it kind of varied a little bit more, but for the most part, it kind of go up to the right. Fraser testified that the scope's high variation would actually work in favor of the shoot uh, of the shooter, with a mo uh, target moving away from the shooter. No lead correction would have been necessary to follow the target. Quote at that range, and at that distance, 175 feet to 265 feet, with this rifle and that telescopic sight. I, uh, I would not have allowed any lead. I would have made any. Uh, I would not have made any correction f uh, for the lead uh, for that size and scope. Now, now one of the big things that I keep hearing about doesn't make any sense to me. I've seen the picture. I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. And that's of course Badge Man. Uh, Badge Man uh, is a picture that was taken across the street from where Zapruder was filming. Uh, which shows that there is someone behind the fence on the grassy knoll, uh, and who's it looks like he's wearing a badge. Um, I keep looking at various versions of this picture. I've looked at a couple different ones, enhanced and everything. I don't see it. I just don't see it. Uh, this is clearly a case of pareidolia. But let's say that it wasn't a pareidolia and it was a gunman. This is a bit, this is an extremely hard shot to take when you're looking at from the book depository building. And it, it's going somewhat of a straight line, right? It's it's kind of it, you know there's not much movement. It's kind of going up a little bit, and especially since it's going up, it's it's easy, like it like like the FBI guy said, um, it's it's a little bit easier shot to take because you don't have to correct as much because uh, you know the gun's going to go that way. Uh, correcting it up is fairly easy, but correct correcting and going across. Uh, across your own view, that's that's kind of a really difficult shot to take. In fact. Um, Oliver Stone had hired snipers to try to emulate this, and then when one of them actually hit the target, it didn't hit them in the head. But when it actually hit him and hit him, uh, it was a really horrible, uh, horrible shot. It took a lot of a lot of tries. Um, these were sharp shooters that he found the best of the best to do, and they couldn't do it. So either way, this is this is a, the grassy knoll does not make any whole lot of sense. Yes, it would have been a clear shot, but it probably would have hit Jacqueline. Uh, and if anything at all.
and again, where's where'd the bullet go? The, the bullet went went through his head, uh, and it, where did it go? No one actually found another bullet in, uh, across the street. So, all right. So the magic bullet theory is probably the worst of them all, but yet for some reason, this is the biggest thing that all the conspiracists point to. Always, 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 and it's so easily refuted. The only thing you need to do is actually look at the limousine. That's it. You look at the limousine and where everybody was seated, and there you go. It's debunked. It is the biggest piece of crap. And it's it's a lie. It's I believe that it's an, actually an intentional lie by the people that are uh, purporting it. I can't believe that anybody who researches this and truly believes this uh, and, and is selling it is, is honestly telling the truth. All right, so the magic bullet theory is – that uh, or the single bullet theory is, you know, that the bullet that um, struck Kennedy first that went through uh, that went to his back, came out of his throat um, and then hit Connolly in front of them. Uh, Governor Con- Governor Connolly of Texas, um, that that is bunk, because in order for that to happen, the bullet would have to go through zigzag forward. You know, zig, they kind of do like a little zigzag motion and then enter him because it's not possible at that angle. And the reason why they think that is the case is because they place Connolly directly in front of, of, of uh, Kennedy, which is not where he was sitting. He was sitting to his front left. And not only was he sitting to his front left, Kennedy was also having his arm like was sitting as far left, uh, far right as possible. He had his arm on you know on on the side of the thing waving at people so he was his butt was as far left as possible and his and Connolly was sitting in front of him to the to the seat was to his left uh even more so considering that Kennedy was kind of leaning out of the side a little bit so you have you have the the jump seat uh in front of him a few inches and then Kennedy leaning out a little bit. So when the bullet comes through, that is a direct, uh, direct line. Look at the pictures when they illustrate the magic bullet theory, they're always placing Kennedy or Kennedy directly behind Connolly. That is not where he is sitting. Look at any picture of the limousine and you will see that Kennedy is to, uh, Kennedy is, um, or Connolly is to his front left. In all, all, all of the all of the pictures coming from the Dealey Plaza, he's always at his front left, always. This is a lie, um, and it's de- and it's demonstrably so. And this is kind of like for for me, this is the smoking bullet that these conspiracy theories are genuinely garbage, and people selling them are selling uh they're selling snake oil. That's what they're doing. They're selling snake oil, and I, I never could uh, wrap my head around that magic bullet thing, but. Now, even worse, out of all of them, <laughs> the even the worst one of all uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you just think about it for a little bit. And that is, okay, well, Oswald did kill him. Um, you know, he did it alone, but he did it on the part for the mob or the CIA or whatever. Um, that one doesn't hold too much water if you just kind of think about it. It's like, why would they let K- Oswald go free? After the assassination, why wouldn't there have been a car? Why would they just let him run off and catch some buses and cabs and, you know, go back home where, you know, he, you know, that he's going to get caught. He's not being very, he's not a very smart or stable individual. He's not the kind of guy you would want to hire for the crime of the century, you know, an avowed Marxist who uh, has mentally, you know, is mentally unstable, who already tried killing someone already and failed. Um, this is, you know, he's not the best marksman. He's a good, he's, he's a decent marksman, but he's not, he's, he's a good shot. He's not a great shot, but you have all these factors coming into play that just don't make a lot of sense. He's not the candidate that you're going to want to hire. And secondly, why would you just let him, you know, run, start running around all over town? Why not pick him up in the car, you know, and, you know, and take him out, you know, get him out of there, kill him. So that way he doesn't, you know, his. His crazy brain doesn't make him do something stupid like, you know, admit it to the police or something, which he was he was trying to do. He was trying to say that he was a patsy when he was arrested. It doesn't make any sense why why the why why one you would choose the guy and two just let him go after the after the case. Why wouldn't you pick him up and take him to Cuba? Why wouldn't you pick him up and kill him? Why wouldn't you just, you know, take him somewhere where he would, you know, live a lavish lavish life somewhere? None of that makes any sense. 
But anyways, I definitely would recommend you guys go check out um, at least read the Warren Commission. If you're going to if you're going to be a critic of the Warren Commission, the good thing to do would be a, uh, uh, at least read it. Most people I've run into who are critics of the Warren Commission have not read the Warren Commission. Read the Warren Commission or re- read Reclaiming History or at least peruse it. Uh, try to pick out what, what conspiracies you like the best and uh, hear a reasoned response to it. Um, or uh, another thing is, is that on YouTube, there's a playlist of um, Vincent uh, Bugliosi's, um trial. Um, and I'll link it in the description. I think I said I was going to do it anyway. So it's a YouTube playlist where they actually show the uh, the mock trial, and it's a really interesting trial, and it really kind of goes through, and it kind of shows you how how weak all of these these arguments are. But anyways, thank you for listening. Uh, I'm not going to plan on doing any more solo podcasting thing, but I just wanted to have something out today. Um, uh, Libertarians on Fire is a great show, um, but it, in you know, he may, he may disagree with this, but whatever. Uh, I'm not trying to cause part pod beef, but this is, I've already had pod beef. I've already started pod beef with him, but, or at least one of his co-hosts. But, it, you know, it did inspire me to get something out today and to talk about this and something that has been kind of interesting, interesting to me lately. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, this causes some, uh, some dialogue, at least if, if not with, you know, some of the listeners or whatever. Uh, hopefully, hopefully with, um, uh, hopefully with some of the, uh, you know, some of the uh, content. And we do have a contact form, so if you want to contact me, I'll be more than do it. And I'll probably do a Q&A of this as well. However, um, I do have an Ask uh, Jim Jesus, Send Your Problems to Jesus, which I'm going to read now. This comes from Matthew John Hayden. Uh, he's one of the UK listeners who has been promoting the show. By, by the way, thank you. Um, here's my question to you. Oh, I got to talk in a limey voice. <laughs> Here's my question to you, fucking yank, cis white grind fam. If a tree falls in the forest, but everybody's been physically removed, so to speak, does it make a sound? And the answer is yes. Yes. It makes the sound of oppression. So, uh, anyways, so any, like again, I'm not going to probably do another uh, solo episode, but I just wanted to have something fun to get out. Uh, make you well aware of my position on the JFK assassination, which I'm sure most of you uh, disagree with. So uh, send the hate mail. Uh, there's a contact form. There's also Jim at JimJesus.com or if your big hammer hurts, that's Jim at FDR.com slash donate URL or dot AOL.com slash badaudio.com org. So, so go ahead and send all your emails and hate my way and God damn it! What fucking show? Fuck! Tired of dealing with governments? Wish there was a better way of not getting busted committing victimless crimes? Tired of having to listen to your parole officer? Never again with the Bipcot NoGov Human License Wristband. This wristband has a NoGov patented NoGov hologram technologies that work on your aura chakras to fungus shui vibrational energy something something to woo state agents off of your trail. It's like they can't even see you. The best part is it actually works. It doesn't actually work. It's so easy to use. Just put it on your wrist or within three inches of your quantum sacred geometry spirit energy and commit all of the victimless crimes you want and totally get away with all of them. Them. And by all, we mean none. And with the fancy Lowbirds podcast logo on the side, you'll be the life of Porkfest. And all of this could be yours for $4.99 plus $2 shipping and handling. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA, FTC, or any other three letters. This product is not intended to prevent, defend, or protect you from any legal action from the state. This product contains chemicals known to the state of California to cause cancer and birth defects or other reproductive harm. Move to New Hampshire, Nevada, or anywhere else that isn't a shithole and you'll probably be fine. These bands are total bullshit. They don't actually work. If this needs to be said to you, you should probably drink bleach. This is just neat looking merchandise that can start an interesting conversation with yet to be libertarians. Order today at Lulberts.com. Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists like Barack Obama and Al Gore taking credit for the web while trying to take over the web? Are you disgusted by experts whose concept of the internet is that it's a series of tubes? Take back the free market of computing by encouraging software developers to adopt the BIPCOT NoGov license. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows any use or modification except by governments. Go to bipcot.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. 
for some reason in, the, in this country and in a bunch of the Western world, it's okay to just judge. Hey, this is Michael Dean from the Freedom Fiends Radio Show. Computer programmer Derek Slopey and I have created Fiend Phone. I'm using Fiend Phone right now to talk with and record one of my co-hosts in real time. Take it, Davi. Hey, this is Davi Barker, and I'm a thousand miles away from Michael, but we sound like we're in the same room. We sure do, Davi. So, Davi, please tell the nice people more about Fiend Phone. Fiend Phone is free, no-gov software that opens up a global world of possibilities for collaborative, high-quality, remote voice media production, and I'm digging it. People can try Fiend Phone right now at FiendPhone.com, but we're also raising money to vastly improve Fiend Phone and vastly improve independent talk media worldwide. So go to FiendPhone.com to help out. Who will build the audio roads? We will, with your help. That's FiendPhone.com. F-E-E-N-P-H-O-N-E.com. Foxtrot, Echo, Echo, November, Phone.com. FiendPhone. I never knew remote audio could be this good.